Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 51, Black Caesar. John Caesar, nicknamed Black Caesar, was the first Australian bushranger and one of the first people of African descent to arrive in Australia. Caesar was thought to have been born in Madagascar or in the West Indies in about 1763. He fled to England to escape plantation slavery. Caesar was a common name for male slaves and it's possible he was from the American colonies and came to London during the American Revolution. So there's a few theories as to his origin. What is known is on the 13th of March 1786 at Maidstone, Kent, he stole 240 shillings, although some say four shillings and four pence, so a very big difference, from a dwelling house. He was tried at Deptford, Kent on the 17th of March and was sentenced to transportation for seven years due to previous convictions of picking the pockets of sailors on London's waterfront. He was initially sent to the prison hulk, Ceres, before leaving England on the Alexander in May 1787, aged about 23. His occupation was listed as servant or labourer and was also described as a black servant from Madagascar. The ship reached Botany Bay with the first fleet on the 19th of January 1788. Popularly known as Black Caesar, he became known in the colony as a hard worker and a conscientious labourer. He was almost two metres tall and immensely strong, and the small rations of the colony compelled him to steal in order to sustain himself. And there are records pertaining to this. On the 30th of April 1788, John Caesar was accused of stealing four pounds of bread, the property of Richard Partridge. Partridge said that he missed some bread from his tent on Tuesday evening, the 29th of April. He suspected Caesar, who denied the theft. Partridge felt some bread in Caesar's bag, but Caesar said that Mr. Sharp had given it to him. On the 29th of April 1789, he was tried for theft and sentenced to a second term of transportation, this time for life. And Scott wrote, Two black men, in brackets convicts, one by the name of Caesar and the other called Black Jemmy, were tried by the criminal court for theft, Caesar transported for life. A fortnight later, Caesar, described as an incorrigibly stubborn black, bolted with some provisions, an iron pot and a soldier's musket, and garden robberies became very frequent. On the 13th of May, 1789, Scott recorded in his diary, Black Caesar the convict eloped from camp, taking with him arms and ammunition belonging to Abraham Hand, Marine, with several other articles, and took to the bush. However, any intention he had of living off the land was soon abandoned because of the scarcity of game. Instead, he began prowling around the outskirts of the settlement with a loaded musket and stealing what food he could find. On the 26th of May, he narrowly escaped capture after he'd helped himself to the rations of a gang who were making bricks at Brickfield Hill. And Scott wrote, Black Caesar robbed the brickmakers of a quantity of provisions pursued by a party from quarters but to no effect. On the night of June the 6th, he was caught by a convict by the name of William Saltmarsh while attempting to steal some food from the house of the colony's assistant, commissary for stores, Zachariah Clark. And a settler named William Blakehurst set a trap of provisions and nets and captured the black rogue alive. To celebrate his success, Blakehurst invited four friends to a party, settling down to drink a gallon of rum apiece. Quarrelling with one of them, Blakehurst flogged him across the head with an axe. And Sydney Town had its first murder. Blakehurst fled to the bush and Governor Philip posted a notice, wanted for murder, William Blakehurst, the reward five gallons of rum. There was no record of a trial of Caesar at this time, however, possibly because Caesar's capture presented Governor Philip with something of a dilemma. The governor had to protect the colony's scarce food supply, but he saw value in Caesar as a labourer. He was sent to work in chains at Garden Island, and in addition to his ration of provisions, he was to be supplied with vegetables from the garden. 
Although there's no evidence that Garden Island was ever put to the same use as a place of confinement as Pinchgut, it would seem that a few convicts were sent there to work in vegetable gardens planted for the benefit of the crew of the HMS Sirius. They laboured in irons and some roughly constructed huts were erected for accommodation. Caesar was one of them and it's curious to note that on account of his colour, none of his fellow convicts were willing to hut with him. David Collins, the colony's judge advocate, declared... This man has always been reputed to be the hardest working convict in the country, but incorrigibly stubborn. His frame was muscular and well calculated for hard labour, but in his intellects he did not very widely differ from a brute. His appetite was ravenous, for he could in any one day devour the full ration for two days. To gratify his appetite he was compelled to steal from others, and all his thefts were directed to that purpose. He was such a wretch and so indifferent about meeting death that he declared while in confinement that if he should be hanged, he would create a laugh before he was turned off by playing off some trick upon the executioner. In December 1789, Caesar escaped for a second time. Caesar the Black, whose situation on Garden Island had been some time back rendered more eligible by being permitted to work without irons, found means to make his escape, taking with him a canoe which lay there for the convenience of the other people employed on the island, together with a week's provisions belonging to them, and in a visit which he made them a few nights after on his canoe, he took off with an iron pot, a musket and some ammunition. His efforts to survive in the bush by robbing the settlers' gardens, threatening encamped Aborigines and taking their food were fruitless, and on the 31st of January 1790, after only a week and a half, he returned to camp, having been speared by local Aborigines. It was reported Caesar, a notorious convict, a native of Madagascar, delivered himself up to the officer at Rose Hill. He has been absent since the 22nd of December when he ran off with a canoe from Garden Island and on the 25th paid them a visit in the night and stole a musket which he dropped in a garden at Rose Hill a few nights since, being closely pursued. The account he gives of his subsisting himself so long a time was that when he saw a party of natives with anything on or about their fire, he frightened them away by coming suddenly on them and swaggering his musket, then helped himself to whatever they had left. In this manner he made out very well without ammunition, sometimes robbing gardens. When he lost the musket he found it impossible to subsist himself. He was then attacked by the natives and wounded in several places and escaped from a party of them through a very thick brush when he surrendered himself. And there's an account of when he surrendered. After his escape from and subsequent visit at Garden Island, he found his way up to Rose Hill, whence he was brought very much wounded by some natives whom he had met in the woods. Being fearful of severe punishment for some of his late offences, he reported on being brought in that he had fallen in with our cattle, which had been so long lost, that they had increased by two calves, that they seemed to be under the care of eight or ten natives who attended them closely as they grazed, and that on his attempting to drive the cattle before him, he was wounded by another party of natives. The circumstances of him being wounded was only part of his story that met with any credit, and it could not well be contradicted, as he had several spear wounds about him in different parts of his body, but everything else was looked upon as a fabrication, and not that well contrived, to avert the lash which he knew hung over him. He was well known to have as small as share of veracity as of honesty. His wounds, however, required care and rest. He was secured and placed under the surgeon's care at hospital. Two months later, in March 1790, Collins wrote, Almost one third of the population... 116 male and 68 female convicts with 27 children were put on board the Sirius and the Supply. Among the male convicts, Governor Philip had sent the troublesome and incorrigible Caesar on whom he had bestowed a pardon and was to be the servant to Dr Considen on Norfolk Island. So on Norfolk Island he did gain a measure of independence. By the 1st of July 1791 he was supporting himself on a lot at Queenborough and was issued with a hog. In January of 1792, he was given one acre and was ordered to work three days a week. He had a daughter with Anne Power, a convict, who'd arrived on the Lady Juliana in 1790, and this baby was born on the 4th of March 1792. Caesar returned to Port Jackson in the Kitty 12 months later, leaving behind Anne and his daughter, 
Caesar decamped in July 1794. He was still incorrigible. He took up his former practice of subsisting in the woods by plundering the farms and huts on the outskirts of the town. He was soon back in custody, and after being severely flogged, he declared exultantly and with contempt all that would not make him better. Caesar was not the only troublemaker in the colony, and even more concerned was Pemawi, an Aboriginal who was leading a guerrilla warfare of resisting the colonists. Late in 1795, he was with a party at Botany Bay that was attacked by Aboriginal warriors led by Pomelwi, whom Caesar wounded. Caesar managed to kill Pomelwi and was proclaimed a hero throughout the colony. Caesar escaped from custody for the last time in December 1795 and led a gang of absconders and vagabonds in the Port Jackson area, thus becoming Australia's first bushranger. Collins noted that every theft that was committed was ascribed to him and it was said of him that he gave more trouble than any other convict in the settlement. Settlers were warned against supplying him with ammunition, and on the 29th of January 1796, Governor Hunter offered a reward of five gallons of spirits for his capture. Collins wrote, The many robberies which have lately been committed render it necessary that some steps should be taken to stop a practice so destructive of the happiness and comfort of the industrious, and it is well known that a fellow known as Black Caesar has absented himself for some time past from his work and has carried with him a musket. Notice is hereby given that whoever shall secure this man, Black Caesar, and bring him in with his arms shall receive a reward of five gallons of spirits. Notwithstanding the reward that has been offered for apprehending Black Caesar, he remained at large and scarcely a morning arrived without complaint being made to the magistrates of a loss of property supposed to have been occasioned by this man. In fact, every theft that was committed was ascribed to him. A cask of port was stolen from the mill house, the upper part of which was accessible, and the sentinels who had charge of that building being tried and acquitted, the theft was fixed upon Caesar, or some of the vagabonds who were in the woods, the number of whom at this time amounted to six or eight. And an article in October 1896 in the paper says, One of the most formidable of this class was a Negro convict known as Black Caesar. He had been under punishment and had been whence he escaped and took to the bush, continuing long a plague to settlers as the colony extended. Once he came in and evidently counted upon mild treatment in return for important information which he tended. This was that he had come across bulls and cows that had strayed and, although at the time energetically sought, had never been recovered. Caesar said he knew where they were, but his representation was regarded as a trick to escape punishment. He was flogged and took the first chance to bolt again, taking a musket and ammunition to renew his depredations. A reward was offered for his apprehension, and the people have learned something of bushcraft. Two men laid themselves out to come upon him, which they effectually did. They, unseen, watched him overnight take shelter in a brush, and on his emerging the morning, got first shot and mortally wounded him. By this time, 1796, there were six or eight men ranging the bush and supposed to plunder outlying settlements or to prompt the natives with whom they had managed to fraternise how to raid the settlers with impunity. On 15th of February 1796, Caesar was shot by John Winbow at Liberty Plains, which is now today Strathfield, and he died after being carried into Thomas Rose's hut. And Collins in his diary writes... Information was received that Black Caesar had that morning been shot by one Wimbo. This man and John Ruse, lured by the reward, had been for some days in quest of him. Finding his haunt, they concealed themselves at night at the edge of a brush which they perceived him to enter at dusk. In the morning he came out, and when looking around him and seeing his danger, he presented his musket, but before he could pull the trigger, Wimbo fired and shot him. He was taken to the hut of Rose, a settler at Liberty Plains, where he died in a few hours. Thus ended a man who certainly during his life could never have been estimated at more than one remove above a brute and who had given more trouble than any other convict in the settlement. And just an aside with John Ruse, he was the first to set foot on Australia. He was the first to turn a furrow. He was the first to grow wheat. He was the first to be pardoned and he married the first pardoned woman. And he was involved in killing the first bushranger in Australia. He drew the first reward offered for such service in the colony and sunk the first grave on what we know now as Rookwood Cemetery. And there was where the body of John Caesar was buried. The mother of his child, Anne Power, 
Well, Anne Power was also known as Anne Poor or Anne Powell and was possibly born in 1766 in Maidstone, Kent, England. She was convicted in the Kent Assizes in Maidstone in March 1787 when she was 21. Anne and another woman, Anne Doyle, were convicted for a burglary at East Greenwich involving the theft of a pair of sheets, clothing and linen. They were sentenced to death, which was later commuted to seven years' transportation. And she departed on the Lady Juliana as part of the Second Fleet in 1789 and arrived in Sydney on the 3rd of June 1790. The Lady Juliana was significant as it was the first ship to bring all female women to the colony. Two months later, in August 1790, she was sent to Norfolk Island and cohabitated with John Caesar. And in 1792, their daughter was born and later baptised as Mary Ann Fisher Power, but the father was stated as John Caesar. Caesar returned to Port Jackson 12 months later, leaving Anne and Mary Ann behind and died in March 1796 when her daughter was only four years old. And John Caesar also died in 1796 in Sydney. And after the death of her mother, Mary Ann appears to have been adopted by Mary Fisher, who was Mary Randall, and she came out on the Lady Juliana as well. She was the de facto wife of William Fisher, or William Blatherhorn, as he was called, who had come out on the Charlotte in the First Fleet. What happened to Mary has been the subject of some research and conjecture. By most accounts, she spent her entire childhood and teenage years on Norfolk Island, being the last one to leave the first settlement there in 1813. As an orphaned mixed-race daughter of an infamous convict father, her prospects and social standing would have been quite low. Her survival would have depended on the charity of others and learning how to serve productively. The prospect of leaving Norfolk Island, the only place she'd ever known and where she obviously made her way on her own, was probably quite daunting. The following is from the book Black Founders by Cassandra Pybus. Mary Ann had two children. The father was not listed. Rebecca, born about 1807, and Sarah, born about 1809, under the surname of her mother, Mary Ann Poor. In 1813, Mary Ann and her daughters travelled with Mary Randall and her de facto husband, William Fisher, to Port Dalrymple in Van Diemen's Land. There is a record of Mary Poor in the employ of Major Andrew Giles in 1813 who was then the commandant of Hobart Town. She may have continued in the service of the man who replaced him, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Davy, although he was relieved in 1817 by Lieutenant Governor Sorrell, and he apparently returned to Hobart in mid-1818 to visit his wife and daughter who remained there. Did he perhaps suggest or persuade Mary to travel to New South Wales? Davy did go back to Sydney until 1821. So an Anne Poor is recorded as departing Hobart in 1818, bound for Port Jackson. In 1821, she's recording it living at Port Macquarie, New South Wales, with Mary Randall and her husband, Thomas Cresswell. And it's there that Mary Anne Poor married the convict George Greenway. On the 20th of March, 1822, she accompanied her husband, George, to Newcastle on the Elizabeth Henrietta. George was still a convict and he was transported there. Mary Ann was listed in the 1823, 1824 and 1825 muster as the wife of George Greenway convict who came out on the fortune in 1812 and he received 14 years sentence. He was classed as a government employee at Port Macquarie. Anne Greenway, Greenaway, BC wife of George Greenaway, Sarah Greenaway, BC child of the above. We don't know where the other daughter, Rebecca, is. Greenway died in 1825 and he was buried on the 9th of July, 1825, at Port Macquarie. The burial register has his abode as Port Macquarie, age 38, prisoner, ship fortune. He died of dysentery and he was one of the many who died of this disease in Port Macquarie at this time. Mary Ann then married Joseph Connor on the 17th of May, 1824, at Port Macquarie. The marriage record states marriage of Anne Poor, free, to Joseph Connor, prisoner, per ship Sally, September 1821. There is a Joseph Connor that was recorded as a prisoner at Newcastle from April 1819 until 1822. Mary Ann's death is most likely the following record. Anne Connor, 10th of January 1825, age 32, free, at Port Macquarie. 
Mary's daughters, Sarah and Rebecca, well, Rebecca was born Rebecca Poor and she was born in 1807 on Norfolk Island. She's recorded in the 1820 Port Del Rio Pool Muster. Interestingly, she's listed immediately after Norfolk Piper, age 10. He's Captain Piper's son. Also in 1824, when her mother married Joseph Connor, one of the witnesses was Rebecca Piper. She would have been 17 years old at this point. So this could be confirmation that Rebecca's father was actually John Piper. John Piper was born in 1773 in Scotland and was commissioned as ensign to the newly formed New South Wales Corps in April 1791. In 1793, he was sent to Norfolk Island and it was there he was promoted to lieutenant in 1795 and returned to New South Wales when he was promoted to captain in 1800. In 1804, he was again detailed for duty on Norfolk Island and became commandant in 1805. Piper spent the next six years on the island. He was back in New South Wales by 1810, so that Rebecca being born in 1807 to a line in 1822, he retired to farming life in Bathurst with his wife and family. In 1844, under the name Rebecca Fisher, she married Joseph Wigley at Kelso, New South Wales, when she was 37. They are recorded at living at Mr Ford's farm, Back Swamp, near Kelso in 1852. And there it is that Rebecca Wigley died in 1855 at Bathurst. Her age was recorded as 56, but based on muster records, she would have been 48. Her sister Sarah, Sarah was born Sarah Poor in 1809 on Norfolk Island. She was recorded in the 1820 Port Del Rio Pool Muster. On the 5th of April 1826, Sarah is recorded in the Sydney General Sessions Court, convicted of common prostitution. She was sentenced to the Parramatta Female Factory for three months and was released on July 16th. Her mother had only died a little over a year before. There is a record for a convict, John McAllister, requesting permission to marry Sarah Fisher in 1837. This Sarah Fisher is listed as free, but her age is not recorded. John was 34. If it was Sarah Poor, she would have been 28. Sarah did not state her marriage status and it did not state whether the request was allowed. And there was no further information on Sarah to be found. And some family trees have Anne Poor and John Caesar having another child, John, who Caesar would not have known about. Caesar left Norfolk Island around March 1793. Anne gave birth to a son six months later on the 13th of September 1793 on Norfolk Island. John's death is recorded on the 19th of December 1806 on Norfolk Island. However, his mother, Anne, had died in 1796 when he was only two. So did Mary Randall and William Fisher adopt John too? Unfortunately, there are a lack of records to prove that. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.